Welcome to episode one of an idea I like to call Home Lab is on prem cloud. Because if you are following good security and reliability practices when you set up your local services, then a lot of those services could just as easily have been deployed as non local cloud services. So that's cloud networking there in that rack that you're making. These videos are for documenting my learning path. Hopefully, I'm doing them in a way that is useful and interesting, at least to people who are interested in network technology. Um, on the front side of this video, I will attempt to do the following. First, I will be using an already existing Proxmox VE server to set up a Windows Server 2016 instance as a guest VM. Part of this will be installing the VertIO drivers so that we've got a little better performing hard drives, network, and memory access. Once that's done, I'll add Active Directory. Following that, configuring a couple users uh, security-wise and allowing them to use RDP to log in and admin the server from Linux, Windows, and Android. The next video in the series will begin with me setting up better security for the logins of the users I already made, adding a few more users, and setting up the DNS so that it works locally with a pie hole, ad blocker, and local DNS provider sitting in front of the Windows Server DNS, and make every, everybody work together. Alrighty then, the first order of business will be to install Windows Server 2016. It has already been downloaded, as have the driver files. So, what's going to happen is this is going to be installed and then before it is even executed it will be cloned. Then the clone will be the server that actually gets used. So we're going to use a Windows VM ID, <laughs> a VM ID that I don't use. Um, I'm going to call it the WinServer 2016 Pristine. And the files are in, indeed in backup. This is the server. Now, of course, we need to tell it that it is Windows and that it is 2016. Windows 10, 2016, and 2019 are all grouped together because they use the same kernel or close enough to where the VM engine doesn't care about the differences. Uh, the graphics card standard. Everything no here is normal. Don't change this. Make sure this says Vert IO SCSI. There are other VertIO things here we don't want to mess with. The driver is going to be specifically for the VertIO SCSI that we're going to use. Turn on the QEMU agent. It will be installed later to uh, assist for better communication between the VM engine and the guest. This gets changed to SCSI. Device 0 is fine. We're not going to store it there. We're going to store it in the virtual space volume, which is a volume that is local to the server for best results. It is a double SATA um, setup that came with the uh, server. It's very nice. So we have uh, right back. That is the end discard. This is the optimization. Okay. Um, we'll add a drive later. We're not going to do it now, though. The context is the wrong place for that. Uh, four core seems to be really nice. The performance is, is pretty decent. So we'll give it four cores. Actually, uh, we're going to do something different. We're going to give it two sockets and two cores. There are four cores. From my understanding, 
for best operation you need to saturate the sockets each instance of win 2016 as i understand it uh, is sold for two next on the list is to actually do the install so this is the pristine server that will not be used this is if the installation process goes horribly wrong then I do not need to recreate a VM I already have it created um, I have both drives loaded all I have to do is reclone this and start it back up when you're using Proxmox the best thing to do is clone when you are working on mastering a technology the way I am here the entire purpose of this is to gain familiarity with Win Server. Me being a long-time Linux user, Linux admin, um, Windows is a, a new thing. I've been working with it for a, almost a week now. And uh, so we're going to look at uh, the hardware. We've got everything set here. Remember, two sockets, two cores, four processors. It did read that properly. We have both drives, one hard drive. We have 60 gigs. Um, use the notes. One thing that I found is really handy to use notes. This is a, a markdown um, editor. So you just put your text in here. Number sign, space means it's a, a bold, or a, a, a heading two stars asterisks front and back mean this is a bold the dashes indicate a unordered list three dashes in a row is meet a line so this becomes this very nice looking so the idea is to create the vm we'll add the the drivers set the name we're almost done here Set the name, stop the VM, clone for further dev. The idea here is once we install Windows, once we install the drivers properly, we will then clone one more time. So we'll have a pristine clone that has no work done to it. We'll have a dev clone which has the preliminary work done to it so that it is a usable functioning system that we can then further add to and then of course we will add active directory so here we go um, this can take a while if it takes too long I will through the magic of editing, compress time. Excellent. Now, the trick here is going to be taking the custom path, not the standard path, so we can install our vert IO drivers. Now we're going to use the desktop experience because I am nowhere near confident enough to use just text. Try getting past that without the license. Okay, there we go. Here's the trick. Load driver. Yes, browse. Go into this. And let's go ahead and do, actually, let's do the vert IO for the SCSI first. There you go. 
this is correct. I don't know if you noticed, in the original list of drives, let's see if it's still back behind here. Oh, we can't move it. Oh, this wasn't here before. The 60 gig drive just showed up because now it can read it because it has drivers. We will do two more drivers. We will do a balloon, which is a memory function. Yes. And let's see if I can remember the next one. It was the network. Where is the network? At KVM, is that it? Before I make a terrible error, I believe I have it. Yeah. Net KVM, that is correct. There we go. The reason we're doing this is because a virtual machine communicates to the host machine through the virtual machine interface. There's an API interface between there. It never actually touches the host hardware under ideal circumstances. That's kind of the whole point. In this case, the drivers bring the guest closer to the metal to allow it, in some cases, to communicate pretty closely to directly with the metal for better throughput. And we're going to have improved drive, we're going to have improved uh, memory allocation and throughput, and we'll have improved networking speed because uh, of doing it the way we have here. And we're done. Now, I could have formatted the drive there. Um, it's a real simple process, but Windows does the same thing. It, it, you just click on the clicky and it goes. And that's the beauty of this thing, I suppose, for people. So, this is the part that takes a while. I will experience it all the way through, lucky me. I will compress time for anyone watching this video. See you in a little bit. All right, it looks like we're doing okay here. create a super secret password that is still something you will remember.
Yay! All right, so we can... In case you don't know, this is a console through to the VM. Me typing here actually will go to my host, the computer that I'm running all of this on. So what we're going to do is we're going to inject. We can inject a control, alt, or a Windows control. We can inject tab, escape, or control, alt, delete, which is what it wants us to do to inform it that we want to do something with it. According to our schedule here, we need to set the name, and then stop it, and then clone it. Oh, this is kind of interesting. This is a graph of how it's been doing. CPU usage, network. Now it's checking the network. This is RAM usage. Okay, do you want to allow? Yes, in this case, that's fine. Ooh, very nice, very nice. These errors are not a big deal. Uh, most of them go away uh, simply because the services are delayed start services, and they're just warning you that these services are delayed starts, um, which are fine. Eventually, they will start, and then this will go away. Um, well, there we are. Now, let's take a local server. We are in work group. We do not have uh, a domain set up yet. The standard old school work group is there. The computer name is win plus random garbage. There actually may be some sense in this, but it looks like random garbage to humans. So we will change this. This will be win server 2016 n one. Node 1. And let's go ahead and do some updates. That way, when we clone it and save it for the devs, we won't have to update it again and again and again. The whole point of using a VM in this manner is to save time and resources. You do something like this once and then you save that work so that the next time you need to grab this appliance you don't need to do that work again, whatever that is. Um, there are sensible breakpoints that can be set that will enhance your workflow greatly. Windows updates are always longer than they seem. This may be a, a thing still. Back in my day, we had what we called Microsoft Minutes. Microsoft would always try to tell you how long an operation would go and how many more minutes. And the most ridiculous thing was usually the, the numbers would just count up quite a bit before they ever counted down. And then when they count down, they counted down wrong. <laughs> Microsoft minutes are not real life minutes. No, not too bad. We're doing real good here. I've got gigabit internet through the house, and I've got a nice fast connection to the house. Not gigabit, but good. All right, I will wait this out. And again, for people watching this video, time will compress for you. Okie doke. So these updates took a long time.
but they are done. There we go. So we are going to stop this now. When you're going to clone, it's best to stop them. Otherwise, you're trying to copy a moving target. That's not a good idea. So, clone. 300 is the pristine. This will be 301. Space. Space, 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 space. And there we go, we're cloning. If there's not a lot of data to copy, it doesn't take very long to clone these. we go. As a matter of fact, we can back this out here. And we can remove the other one. Don't want to do it to those, but we do want... Uh, actually, we can get rid of... Yeah, both of these. These just make the images a little easier to manage and move around if they decide to in the future. Does they still have the hard drive? Excellent. Excellent. Next up is installation of Active Directory. So to do that, we uh, need to take care of a couple things first. Let's set the computer name. Description is correct. To rename, let's rename it. It's going to have to reboot after we rename it. It'll take just a little bit. We will call this There we go. Now, we're going to leave it as a member of a work group because there is no domain existing yet. Normally, at this point, you would also set up a static IP. We are not going to do that. In my network, I utilize DHCP for all machines and for the machines that I desire having a set IP address, DHCP is designed to always provide that IP address. I do that in case I want to change something. I just have one point where I change it at in the DHCP distribution list and all computers automatically at next login fix themselves. It works out very well for me. So we're going to hit OK on this and we're going to restart. Excellent. Just a 
quit once over. This is where you would reset your IP address. So, just real clear, um, because this is so different than Linux, where you just do what you need to do, and you have to know where things are located here. So, it would be under the Ethernet instance, double click, properties, single click, properties, and here you would set it up. Again, I'm not going to do that. This will be addressed again later. I run a pie hole uh, ad blocker and local DNS. The name server DNS in Windows Server must be used for Windows Server to properly function as the domain services provider. However, if you utilize the pie hole, the DNS server, as the first stop for a host to resolve DNS. And then the pie hole has this DNS as its upstream. Everything works perfectly. The pie hole has its own list. If the pie hole knows where things are, then clearly you've set up the pie hole to do that for you. Um, also, the ad block list will resolve which hosts are asking for which services and resources online. If one of your hosts is compromised, you can find that out by seeing that it's going to a specific website. Whereas if it were going through the name service provided by Windows Server, that would be much, much more difficult because that is not its intended purpose. But it is the intended purpose of the pie hole. So the pie hole is in line first as the first DNS resolver. If the pie hole doesn't know, then the pie hole should ask the Proxmox, not the Proxmox, the Windows Server DNS. If the Windows Server DNS doesn't know, then it should go probably to Cloudflare or something like that. So we'll leave this alone here. It will grab it from DHCP. We'll grab the IP from DHCP. That's good times. And we are ready to install Active Directory. It's very simple. This is a role-based, feature-based thing. Let's go forward and Active Directory Domain Services. couple other things that will be added later. I believe it's going to add its own DNS server. I'm not positive. My understanding is that the, DN the DNS services required for Active Directory will come down automatically. No need to ask for the complete unit. This is all correct. Yep, yep, yep. So to do it. And here we go. This will take a while. Editing magic, time compression, engage.
Ah, yes. We need to promote this to a domain server. Keep it clicky. So, we are going to add a new forest. I'll be creating a graphic for this. How best to overlay the Windows way of looking at a network versus the other ways of looking at a network. The root network will be try to use for best practices the dot local on an intranet. If I were to use my actual domain name, olympicsoftworks.org, here, it would actually do a whole lot more than I want. Um, if you put a, a dot org here, it will actually go out and look for it and try to find it and try to use that. Uh, if you're going to do that, the recommended way, say I was going to use my actual domain, then the full domain name would be something like this. They recommend that the subdomain local or something like that be used in conjunction with your top-level domain name. But this is way beyond. Just for a test lab, this is not required. Boom. This will do fine. Going to add a new forest. Correct, 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 correct. Give yourself a password in case you need to redo this and recover the catalogs or something. You're going to need this. This is like the root directory of a uh, database server. Hopefully you never need to use that, but it's there if you do. All right. And... This is correct. So, yeah, you can't even touch this. Um, this is the connectivity that it's trying to grab from the full top-level domain name. Since there isn't one, it can't find one. No surprise. We'll leave whatever it comes up with alone here. We don't use NetBIOS. One of the first attempts at Microsoft of uh, co-opting I believe it was Novell Netware, which was the popular one at this point. Notice that the dot .local is missing. This is just the the actual domain, not the, the, the top level, which is really relevant to uh, case at hand. Now, for better performance, you would ideally have these on different drives on the machine uh, to maximize I.O. Uh, if you're writing to the database, reading from the database, writing to logs, doing something local, all through the same interface, unless you have a very, very fast interface, you're going to have some bottlenecks. Windows has enough trouble with that, so break these up if you need to. We're not going to. Again, this is a test server. Understand that this can be done. We're not going to do that. This is a... Breakdown of what's going on. We're all good. Oh, I did want to show the script. We'll back up once it uh, goes through the prerequisites. Of course, everything's fine. So if we wanted to, executing this script in the Windows uh, PowerTool, whatever they call that, this would actually do PowerShell. This would actually create the same effect as all of the clicking that we've done up to this point. If you're going to automate this and do this on many units, that is what you would want to do. Let me redo the prerequisite check. All 
good. Install. So again, this will take a while. Time compression engaged. There we go. Active Directory, Domain Services, DNS Services. So, at this point, a Windows Server Edition 2016 has been installed, updated, Active Directory has been installed, and it is ready for production setup. So at this point, we're going to make yet another clone. At this point, the servers are going to start having some differentiation. At this point, this server is going to look very similar to any other server I set up when I set up the second one. There, there's supposed to be at least two for availability um, between services for Active Directory. Uh, that will be done. So what's going to happen here is we're going to stop this. remove this because I don't want to copy this. And just put this in 300. And it's gone. Now we can recover it when we want to. So this is going to be a clone. I'm going to clone to 104 which is going to be the second domain controller for the pair that are recommended. Node 2. I'm going to run it from the proper location and work begins. Alright, so far we have been using the console in the Proxmox Virtual Machine Manager 
to interact with our Windows server that we just installed. Um, that's not a good idea. The, the way that servers are normally administered is remotely from machines typically very far away. Um, the machine I'm talking about here is actually on, in another room, but it's only probably 20 feet from me, but it may as well be 20 miles or 200 miles. Um, you almost never get to stand in front of a server, plug a monitor into it and a keyboard, and go to town. Yes, a lot of racks do have built-in screens to do just that and dedicated KVMs, but that's not the norm. So, the first thing we need to do is make sure that we can communicate with our Windows server remotely. We're in Linux, so we're going to use our desktop. We're going to log in as the administrator into the Olisoft account, the Olisoft forest, and we get nothing. You'll notice it connects, and it's talking, but it can't continue. So, let's find out why. So we have, in the, the local server portion, we have things set up. We have the, uh, have the right IP. Yep, 200. We have the right IP. We're connecting properly. So why aren't we connecting? It says remote management is enabled, but remote desktop is not. So, let's get in here and don't allow remote connections. Let's allow remote connections to this desktop. Apply. Okay. Now let's see what happens. Oh, it makes it a little farther. But it's still not connecting. Now, you'll, you'll notice that the errors that are being given here has something to do with the uh, transport layer security. Um, right, SSP, I assume that's a signature, some crypto. We don't have anything set up here. This is a connection right now that has username and password authentication. Oh, actually, this <laughs> we're connecting to the server without even uh, a, a password authentication. We're just going to connect to the server. Once we're connected to the server to get in, we have a password that's required. So, we made it allow remote connections, but we did not unflag allow connections only from computers running remote desktop with network level authentication. That is what the crypto of the authentication down here is. Transport layer security is all involved in this. So, we click this. Unclick this, so we allow and allow. And now, boom, beautiful. So from now on, we are going to connect through the our desktop here, remote desktop protocol. Uh, let's just go back up here to summary. We'll get this. There we go. So let's go ahead and connect. There we go. There. Windows can be a little laggy sometimes. Tools, users and computers. We need to make our users. We're going to have three users. We're going to have A, B, and C. We're going to have Alex, Beck, and Cody. So here we are. Open this up. Now we have some built-in user group accounts here. We have some built-in 
accounts here and some default users that can be cloned uh, if need be, including the administrator himself or herself. So, right click, new. First thing we're going to do is organize. We're going to make an organizational unit. Then create a group. Now in Windows lingo, this is used to contain, to move around and uh, attribute security functions to various users and other groups. Um, everything is an object. Storage is an object. So uh, I assume network connection is an object. You link the object to a security protocol. You link the protocol to a user or to a group that a user is a member of, and then the users that are a member of the group get the protocol or get the uh, use of the object uh, within their own predefined uh, permissions. So group name is going to be the local user group. It is a security type. It is not distribution, which is used for predominantly email and things of that nature. Security and global, which is the local domain. This is the local domain only. I, I believe this is the, the controller. This is the forest. This is everything. So we're just going to go ahead and leave it at global. And then we're going to create our first user, Alex. There we go. OS Alex, open source Alex, going to connect there. I think it's getting it carried away there. There we go. And when we set these users up, we're going to do the absolute wrong thing. As the administrator, I will know the password of many users. Normally what you would do is you would make them change their name at logon. Um, we're not going to do that. We're just going to leave it as never expires. No one has to change any names. This is only for testing purposes. Do not do this on anything that is going to be used by any real people. Uh, I intend to destroy this server and then rebuild it long before I actually put it into production. So here we go. And we have a user. Let's go ahead and make our second user. We'll make that. Again, don't do that <laughs> unless you unless you know what you're doing. Unless you very much intend to get rid of things and clean it all out before you ever get close to putting it into productions where people can actually use it and have at it and it can possibly become compromised. Okay, no. So we have Alex, Beck, Cody, and we have the local users group. We're going to gather all of these people up, put them into the local users. Yes, it's going to warn you when you do this because you can screw things up very quickly by moving them around outside of their uh, assigned places. And there we go. Now, Alex, that was by double clicking, by the way. You can double click or you can right click and go to properties and you get the same dialog. Now we're going to make Alex a member of the administrators group. There we go. Alex is not the administrator. 
Alex is a member of the administrators. So let's go ahead and verify that Alex can log in. Good. Perfect. So now we have the administrator here. We have an administrator here. Now let us try. <laughs> let's get this going. Let's, uh, let's shrink the, the non administration. Notice, shrunk it right down. This is, whoops, there we go. Let's try this one more time. This time we're going to try it with that. Now, you'll notice, it knows who Beck is. Beck was able to attempt a login, but because of security, Beck is not able to actually log in. Now, this is an interesting thing because, let's see if we can do it with the administration account, not the administrator account. So what has to happen here is we need to grant permissions through not group policy, which is what originally <laughs> I tried and tried, but what actually has to happen is we need the local security policy. We're trying to log into this computer. Apparently, Windows tries to protect itself this way. We need local policies user rights assignment and we need to allow logon through remote desktop services. So the administrators are the, the only group that is currently in this, which is why Alex is able to log in because Alex is actually getting this security right by being a member of the administrators, the members of the administrators are a group of this, and this is what you this this function here, allow logon through remote, is what must be present somewhere in a user's permission list for this to work. Now we could add local user group, but then both Beck and Cody would both be able to log into the server. The idea here would be for Alex to be the local administrator and Beck to have a minor role to maybe read logs or something like that. And Cody is just going to be one of their users. So we're going to add Beck. Now actually we have to add, there we go, it found her. Boom, boom, boom. Excellent. That should work swimmingly. Let's try this one more time. Need to, uh, oh, that was back. That's correct. Interesting. So let's use our administrator, administration account rather. Right here is Alex now. Now, we have remote desktop enabled. We have uh, 
the security set properly, we're going to add back. So you'll notice that Alex already has access because Alex is a member of the administrators. Administrators group can connect no matter what. Even if they're not listed here, administrators can connect. That's why Alex can connect. So we're going to add back into this. Check name. And there we are. So we have Beck and Alex as members of the Remote Desktop Users Group. We're fine, okay. Okay. Now let's try to authenticate here as Beck. It still doesn't work. We gave Beck the proper remote desktop services or did we? There is a little thing in local security that we also need to tick off here. Local policies, user rights assignment and allow logon through remote desktop services. Beck has to be a member of this. Uh, this policy has to be attached to Beck or to a group that Beck is a member of. So we're just going to go ahead and add Beck to this. There we go. So we have administrators. Notice on the other page it said that administrators were able to log in. That is because administrators are already part of this security policy. It includes the administrators group. Now it includes BEC specifically. If BEC were a member of another group, say instead of just the local users, say the local super users group, if the local super users group were in this list, then BEC would only have to join that group in order to get this privilege and be able to log in. So now we have Beck added through here, through the actual portal. Beck is listed here as well. So we should be good to go. Here's another limitation. I'm sure this can be enlarged, but at the moment, only two users are allowed to connect at the same time to the server. So we're going to go ahead and drop off. There we go. This is Alex's desktop. We'll go ahead and authenticate there. And now Beck is in. So we have the administrator able to log in. We have Alex, who is an administrator, able to log in. And we have Beck, who is a super user, not an administrator, who is able to log in. Now, if we actually go into this, ah, you'll notice that I was not able to run this tool as Beck. because Beck is not an administrator. So, Beck is in and able to use the facilities as a computer, but not actually as an administrator making changes to the server properties. So that concludes this front part of the video mullet. At this point, a Windows server has been installed into Proxmox. Um, three users have been created <coughs> in the Proxmox. One of them is an administrator. The other is a super user. And the third one is a standard user. And if we try to connect via Cody, I'm sure you'll, you'll see that it, it simply won't work. Cody has none of the...
certifications, none of the permissions required to do this. So, TLDR comes next. 